What I want to talk about is how Varroa got to New Zealand and then the response of the New Zealand gov government to that incursion and it spread through New Zealand and all the bits and pieces that happened in between. And I'll give it to you the kind of, I won't sanitize it at all. I can tell you what we did well, what we did badly, and what things we're a little bit embarrassed about. <laughs> so, if we turn the clock back to about 2000, um, well, probably to about 1995, I designed the surveillance program for New Zealand for Varroa and other pests. And the program was designed around that if we were going to get Varroa into New Zealand, it was going to come into either, either with goods or with uh, people. Using that argument, and because we had limited money we could spend on doing surveillance, the program I designed looked at most places where goods and people go to, which is obviously city areas, so that um, Auckland's our biggest city, so it had the most of the sampling, and then for other cities, the amount of sampling declined with the size of the city. We also had a couple of touristic um, destinations in there as well, although it was ready to make it look good rather than we were expecting Varroa to turn up there. And straight into one of the more embarrassing things is in about 1998, um, the government department who was in charge of all of this decided they could save some money in really consummate bad timing. So they decided because we were already testing bees that we sent overseas for exports, we could test those for Varroa so we didn't need a targeted program. I wrote them at the time and said, this is dumb for a whole lot of reasons. And they basically said, go away. <laughs> but in hindsight, um, Varroa turned up first somewhere in Auckland. And my first introduction to it was, a commercial beekeeper came down to my lab holding a mite. And I looked at it and it was Varroa and then suddenly the world changed. And as our best guess, and I say this is the, one of the more embarrassing bits, the hives that were infected originally were um, almost certainly the hives that we're doing surveillance on, or the ones very close to that. So if we hadn't changed the surveillance program, we probably would have picked up Varroa two years earlier, and the story now would be very different, because we probably would have gone for an eradic eradication attempt. At any rate, enough of, enough, enough of that one. Um, the first thing they did when it was found is they stopped all hive movements in the North Island. And we needed time to work out where Varro had spread to to decide what to do about it. And people not being allowed to move hives at least stopped um, the risk of it spreading further due to um, what beekeepers were doing. So completely non-movement. And we were a bit lucky, I guess. Um, unlucky with the surveillance programme lucky in the timing because this was autumn and beekeepers in New Zealand don't move hives very much in autumn at any rate so being told they couldn't move them really didn't cause much of a problem and once once we had this non-movement in it was a matter of going around and doing surveillance um, and trying to work out actually how far it had spread and we had a really great tool and Sarah in the uh, sampling videos will explain it to you. And what this is a sticky board with mesh in the front of a hive and an and a apistan or Bavarol treatment at the top. And it is 90, 95% probable that you can pick up any hive that's got more than six mites in it. So we did this over most of the North Island to check where it had spread. Interestingly, and it's the thing you have to learn about Varroa, is that when we back, went back and looked through Auckland, hives were dying of it. They, it got so bad, and there was even, even commercial hives were in danger of dying of these varroa infections, yet nobody had noticed. The only person who noticed was a hobby beekeeper who saw something strange and thought they'd come and see something about it. So we were asked to do work out the sensitivity surveillance program for a couple of things. First, a sugar shake, which um, Sarah will show you. And 
For this trial, we needed 300 mites in a jar, that's easy, but we wanted at least 50 mites in the jar as well. And my first attempt is you go and look at the hives and you can't see Rora on any of, any of them. So um, in the end, I closed my eyes and I hunted and I found at least three bees with a Varroa mite to put in each jar of 300 bees. When we went and washed them in alcohol, we had over 200 mites in every jar. And the lesson there is, it's very hard to see mites on bees. If you're using that as a method of determining whether you've got Varroa in your hives, it just doesn't work. You have to use the sampling method. We also did work to do the sensitivity of the um, sticky boards. And so we had a really great method, got a very good distribution, and the, we then had to make a decision, do we try to eradicate or not? And the thing that swayed it really was we found a hive in the middle of Tauranga, which is the middle of our Kiwifred industry. And in that, that area, every year, um, about 100,000 hives get shifted into the area and shifted out of the area. And the thought there was, well, if it has been there since spring, there's probably lots more hives with very low infections that we'll never find. So in the end, a very hard decision, but the, this decision was made not to eradicate it. But the government did a couple of other things, I guess, as compensation in some shape or form. Um, the first one is they put a non-movement line across the centre of the North Island. And Varroa, of course, had only found, been found above that movement line. The idea was that it's not going to stop the spread of Varroa, but it's going to slow it down. And it gives time for beekeepers south of that to really come up to speed on how to manage it, rather than be throwing in the deep end. And one of our legislations is a really great piece that if you use powers to stop hive movement, if you interfere with somebody's business, i.e. they would normally shift hives for pollination, you have to pay them compensation. The great thing about the centre of the North Island, there wasn't a lot of hives moved over that line in any case. So we had the line. The next thing the government did is they asked us to wrote, write a copy of the row manual, which I'll show you later. And we also gave a whole set, big education program, firstly for beekeepers. And what that consisted of, of two day workshops um, throughout the North Island. So these were for commercial beekeepers and almost all commercial beekeepers ca came to them. As I say, you're getting a short introduction to Varroa here, but the beekeepers back then got to a two day workshop on how to understand it and how to control it. Um, we also did a lecture series for key fruit growers um, in the North Island. These are the people who use most of the hives for pollination. Really not to tell them how to control Varroa, but because they rent hives, there were some things that they needed to know, at least so they can sleep better. So line across the centre of the North Island. Another, well, I think it's an embarrassing moment, was um, we, when we got Varroa, we didn't get any other pests, which is great. They, because it's a live bee introduction, we could have got tracheal mite. But in about 2006, the government gave permission for a beekeeper to bring semen into New Zealand. This is honeybee semen um, for a breeding program. Again, I, I stamped my feet and put it up. It was a bad idea, but got outvoted. And in that introduction, we brought deformed wing virus into New Zealand. And unfortunately, Varroa and deformed wing virus is much, much worse than just having Varroa. So that went to the mix about 2006. In the South Island, we did, had a, because we could design it from scratch, we had a very good surveillance program for the South Island. Um, ideal for picking up Varroa early enough in time to do anything about it. And the government said, well, yes, you can have a surveillance program, but we're not paying for it. And, and they made beekeepers in the South Island have a vote on whether they want it or not. And because it was voted for, then everybody had to pay a levy, whether you wanted the surveillance program or not. So the levy was funded from the South Island. And it was really the government that made, in the end, made the beekeepers do it. And we had a management agency who controlled all of that. And they, and to, 
to give them credit, and I was part of the pro, did most of the consultation for it, and also helped design it, and to give the program credit, it picked it up at the level we would have expected to pick it up um, in, the, in the program, and almost perfect. And we picked it up in the Nelson area. And it was well defined, we knew it wasn't anywhere else. So being gullible, myself and some people in the government agencies who do these things, we're busy designing surveillance uh, eradication program. Okay, now how do we eradicate it for um, out of the Nelson region? At the time this was happening, um, a government minister who shall remain nameless um, flew to Nelson in front of a camera and said, ah, oh, it's here, it's going to hit at any rate, we won't do anything about it. Now that, that was a really good argument to make um, if you're not forcing beekeepers to pay for, pay for a surveillance program. Because we made beekeepers pay for it, the government probably should have fronted up and, and carried out the eradication program. But they didn't and then Roa quickly spread out through the rest of the North Island. So currently we have got Varroa everywhere. And when I say everywhere, that means every hive in New Zealand has it. Um, there, and any feral colonies, and I'll talk about those in a little bit later, um, most of those will have had it as well. The other thing we have now, because in about 2010, this is 10 years after getting Varroa, we've got resistance. The mites have become resistant to some of the pesticides that we use, some of the miticides we're using which makes it much, much, much harder to control, control Varroa. Again, I'll talk about that more fully in a separate video. So in summary, um, we got Varroa in New Zealand. We did some really, really good things. We did some that are a little bit embarrassing on the way through. Um, probably one of the best things we did was the education program. Um, at two-day workshops, did beekeepers need to know all that to be able to control the row? Perhaps not. Because in the end, we probably could have sent out an email and say, well, buy these strips, put some in the autumn and some in the spring, and leave it at that. But the one thing the workshops did do is it really encouraged beekeepers to get an understanding of rower and to get an understanding of the sorts of things they can do and not do um, so they can sleep better if nothing else. So that's, a, that's kind of a quick summary of how Varroa came through New Zealand. It's a topic we could probably spend hours on at least.